to Professor H. D. Sankalia Annual Memorial Lecture presented by Sambhasha Foundation, which is an effort to celebrate the legacy of Professor H. D. Sankalia. Sambhasha Foundation is an initiative for the research oriented studies of cultures and languages from around the world, including but not restricted to the past and present lifestyle, ideologies, religious beliefs, art, architecture, fashion, and food habits. The organization aims to study all this from a non-political and non-religious perspective based on scientific research through historical and archaeological research tools. Born on 10th December 1908, Professor Hasmukh Dhirajan Sankhya was an Indian Sanskrit scholar and archaeologist specializing in proto and ancient Indian history. He opened up many forgotten chapters of Indian history and shaped the field of archaeology in India. He completed his master's degree in ancient Indian history from the Bombay University and pursued his PhD in archaeology of Gujarat from the London University in 1937. After coming back to India, he joined Deccan College as a lecturer. In his career, he undertook several explorations and excavated a number of sites which contributed immensely to the Indian history and archaeology. His most important contribution was the creation of Department of Archaeology at Deccan College, Pune. Today, on his birth anniversary, we have organized the first Professor H.D. Sankalya annual memorial lecture as a tribute to him. We invite Professor Gautam Sen Gupta to enlighten us on the topic 9th century terracotta plate from a Buddhist monastic site in West Bengal. Dr. Gautam Sen Gupta is a former professor of the Department of Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, Vishwabharti Shantiniketan. He is also a former Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India. Apart from these, he adorned various prestigious positions such as Director of Archaeology and Museums, Member Secretary of the Center for Archaeological Studies and Training Eastern India, Sectional President of the Indian History Congress, and Member of National Commission of History of Science, INSE. His areas of specialization and interest include art history and historical archaeology of northeastern India. He has published extensively on his own areas of research. Among his notable publications are Custodians of the Past, 50 Years of Archaeological Survey of India, Delhi 2012, and Vibrant Rock, Catalogue of Stone Sculptures, Kolkata 2014. His forthcoming book from Primus is titled Ganga, Brahmaputra and Beyond, Exploring Art and Iconography of Eastern and Northeastern India. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. I request you to take the stage and start the lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Momita. Thank you for the kind words. <clears throat> Allow me to begin with a personal statement. I am deeply beholden to the organizers of this lecture, the Found Sangbasa Foundation, for giving me a rare opportunity to pay my homage to one of the tallest figures in South Asian archaeology, Professor H. D. Sankalia. And what would have been the better occasion for that, this is his birthday. So for me, this is an event of great personal significance and opportunity again to, to offer my homage, my tribute to somebody who is really the great guru of Indian archaeology. Having said that, I shall make some more introductory statements. Today, 
I am going to discuss a early medieval Buddhist monastic site of West Bengal, more particularly northern part of West Bengal. Why am I doing this? Sankhaliyaji's area of specialization included many, many domain and subdomains, but I have chosen to focus on the Buddhist monument and its material largely because I believe that 1937 book of Professor Sankhali titled the University of Nalanda is in all respect a landmark in study of Buddhist cultural and historical and archaeological traditions. Sankalia's book, even seven decades after its publication, remains a major, major source for inquiry into the Buddhist historical and archaeological tradition. So I, when I was asked to pay my homage to Professor H.D. Sankalia, I thought this is probably the right occasion to share with my discerning uh, listeners something about what we all call archaeology of Buddhism. The site that I am going to discuss is, as I said, is a modest, medium-sized Buddhist monastery in Northern Bengal, more specifically in Malda district of Northern Bengal. I have 15 slides with me, but I thought since the terrain is largely unfamiliar with many of my dear listeners, I should first explain what I intended to say and then switch over to the slides. Is that arrangement all right with you? Yes, sir. Perfectly all right. Good. Now, in 1987, a copper plate charter was discovered from a village, more particularly from a mound in, uh, in a village in the district of Malta. The mound is known as Tula Bhita. There are trees over the, there are number of trees on the mound and in course of clearance of a small patch of land below a tree, a local uh, young man chanced upon a copper plate charter. The copper plate charter was brought to the notice of Dr. Gaurishwar Bhattacharya, an amazing <coughs> epigraphist and iconographer who left us two years, two three years back. And he wasted no time. He went straight to the village and took good photographs of the images of the copper plate charter and published it in South Asian studies. The document turned out to be what is called a absolutely, uh, I would say, a, 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 a kind of shock and a pleasure both for those who are interested in the uh, early history of Eastern India. The inscription records the donation of a piece of land by a king called Mahendra Pala to his general Senapati Vajradeva at a place called Udranga Bihar. Now, this is what is special about it, you should ask me. The most important part of this narrative is Mahendra Pala 
is described this in this inscription in this copyright charter as sri devopala padanudhyata which is the standard phraseology used in succession which means he is the son and successor of devopala deva uh, now this is as i said a shock and a pleasure because indian historians even the great rd banerji believed that during the palarin particularly during the time of narayana paladeva there was a massive invasion in bihar and bengal by the gurjara pratiharu king mahendra palo and uh, any document uh, bearing the name of mahendra palo should be linked to the gurjara pratiharu king this inscription clearly shows that the ruler named here mahendra palo is the son and successor of devopala deva and the inscription was do the, the inscription was issued on his seventh regnal year which should be 30s or 30s or early 40s of 9th century so the whole thesis powerful thesis rd banerji wrote a monograph under the title pratihara occupation of magadha fall into pieces the not only this this document is very important but in between scholars have found out 16 more image inscription bearing the name of mahendra palo and issued in different dates from year 2 to year 15 this is issued in the year 7th now this necessitated a restructuring of the political history of eastern india i was about to say dynastic history of eastern india but my friend rajot sannal who has studied mandrapalas records very carefully and published 13 of them has warned me that this is not a matter of dynastic uh, succession not a matter of one ruler intruding between uh, second and the third it's more it's of greater significance it's necessitated this structuring of the entire political history of eastern india in the 9th century because 9th century eastern india was viewed as part of what you all know tripartite struggle palo gurjara pratiharu and rashtrakuta uh, confrontation this inscription and 13 other records clearly show that mohendra palo of the gurjara pratiharu lineage had nothing to do with eastern india this is a palo king and he ruled with great power till 15th century 15th regnal year maybe even later so the thesis of pratihara occupation collapsed and we have now a better understanding of what things happened we should the historians uh, were oblivious of certain important points that had emerged earlier for example shian which is a <coughs> Which, uh, which is a in in Shian there is a stone inscription, fairly long stone inscription, and in that inscription reference has been made to Mahendra Palo as builders and patrons of several temples. This did not occur to uh, historians that why should Dayo Palo, Palo King. should why should noyapalo invoke somebody who had uh, kind of displaced his predecessor nayanapalo so mohendra not that mohendra palo was not known there is an in, important inscription image of surjo from mohishantosh in dinajpur district of bangladesh now preserved in state 
archaeological museum with Bengali, you, you can find more uh, detail about it in our catalog called the Vibrant Rock. So Maishantosh inscription is dated in 15th Regnalia. This is in 7th Regnalia. The, so most of his inscriptions are found from Nalunda, uh, Bihar Sarif, Gaya, and Northern Bengal. So here is evident clearly a king, a powerful king who ruled over the core Palo territory of Bihar, Magad and Barindra. Now, I am going a little out of Nandadirhi Biharo, but I only wanted to share with you the excitement of the discovery of uh, this Jagjivanpur. The name of the village is Jagjivanpur. So Tula Bhita in Jagjivanpur, Bhita means mount. Tula Bhita in Jagjivanpur yielded this momentous, very significant inscription. Now in this inscription, this is where the uh, inscriptional evidence comes to the aid of the archaeologist. The inscription clearly mentions that Vajradeva, who was a general called Senapati in the inscription, Vajradeva caused to be constructed a Buddhist Bihara at this place, which is called in the inscription, which is called in the inscription as Nando Dirghi. No, sorry, the inscription makes it very clear that the inscription that the uh, monastery was constructed at a place which is known as Nando Dirghi Udrango. I would like my discerning listeners to understand the implication of this term. Dirghi is a contraction for Dirghika. Dirghika is a big water body. And Udrango, as you know, is a revenue term, which probably refers to a place where some form of revenue collection, toll collection, etc. happens. So clearly, the site chosen by Vajradeva and granted in his favor by Mahendra Paladeva was not an accidental choice. It was a revenue or toll collection center and the landscape was marked by a very big water body called Nanda Dirki. And here again the, the present comes to illuminate the past. When we started exploring this area, taking cue from the inscription, and obviously taking into account the mounds spread over the site, we are also impressed by the existence still, even in 1990s, existence of two important water body one is called nando digi digi is again a contraction and a what is called the new india aryan form of dirghika so nando digi and another uh, divara in backwater assimilation which is called nando goddess bean so clearly in popular memory nando nando digi Nando Dirghi Bihar, etc., survived. And the also significantly, the, the monum, the mound was also known, it was known as Tula Vita, but this is also known as, as Rajar Mayer Danga, mound of the queen, king's mother. Clearly, in different fragments, in somewhat uh, Changed form, past survived in the memory, in the memory of the present. I would say not survive, it was deeply entrenched in the memory of the in the social memory. So that was another clue that helped us. And 
we decided to excavate the site and the site was ultimately uh, excavated for almost 10 decades beginning with uh, beginning from 1997 onward. Now, before we come to the site, I should also refer to the uh, refer to two features. The area is area of Balda district. You'll see it in the map. It is a part of Borendro that is northern Bengal. Borendro, Kundravardhani, you are all familiar with these two terms. The northern Bengal, north of Ganga. Now, this area for a long time was dominated or dotted with Buddhist religious establishment. There are archaeological evidence for that, but significantly, Shandhakar Nandi, the very important Palo poet who wrote Ramacharito, a collection of uh, verses in double intended. Sundakar Nandi observes that the land, that the Borendra landscape was dominated by the temples of Tara and Lokeshwara. And as we turn to the, uh, even the present landscape, even, our, even in its uh, dilapidated stage, many of the monasteries, many of the Buddhist establishment, many detached Buddhist images in metal and in stone, more in stone, less in metal are available in this area, are seen in this area. So this is an area where Buddhist monastic establishment was an important landmark. Having said this, let me also come to a, a quick comment on the term Biharu. There is a monastic seal that come, that we uh, chanced upon in the debris. The monastic seals is very clear. Monastic seal is very clear. It says Sri Nanda Dirghi Biharoi Arjo Bhikkhu Sangha Arjo Bhikkhu Sanghasya. That's the monastic seal of the Honorable, Venerable Vikku Sangha of, uh, of this area, of Nandadigi. So, so Nandadigi, now let me again, so this is called Bihara. And and you must have heard of Mahabihara. There is a clear hierarchy in the classification of Buddhist monasteries. There are clearly three categories. Mohabihara, Nalanda was a Mohabihara, Shomapura was a Mohabihara, Antichok or Bikram Shila was a Mohabihara, then Karno Shubarno, Rakta Mrittika Mohabihara in Malda in Murshidabad district close by is the Mohabiharo. <coughs> in recent times, Calcutta University Archaeology Department had excavated uh, Mogolmari <coughs> from where we have the seal of a Mohabiharo and a Biharika. So, <coughs> the first category is Mohabiharo the large monastic uh, establishment. The second category is Biharo. <coughs> Modest size Buddhist establishment. And third category is Biharika, small size Buddhist establishment. So this place, Nandodirgi, is a Biharo. It's not and big, it's not as big as Nalanda or Bikram Shida, but it is not 
as small as the Mogolikum Biharika, Mogol Mari in in West West Midnapur district. So this is, as you must understand, this is a modest size uh, establishment, and uh, Directorate of Archaeology and Museums, Government of West Bengal, under the direction of my late lamented colleague Omul Rai, who was deputy director in the directorate, excavated the site for almost 10 years. It's as I have said, it's a mod modest size, mod modest uh, Buddhist establishment, but that does not mean that it grew abruptly. I have already explained to you that it was a, uh, it was Nandadik, was also an Udrongo, and Shina, Dr. Shina Paja's survey of the surroundings of this monastery has clearly demonstrated the existence of number of small and medium-sized habitat mounds, habitation mounds. So the point that I am trying to make and that the point with which you are all familiar, that Buddhist monasteries do not grow in isolation, do not grow in a situation where, for, where patronage is difficult to obtain. It has to grow in a situation where patronage has to come uh, from the neighborhood. This is one indication in this case. As you know, in case of Nalanda, there are reference to number of villages which supported the uh, Nalanda monastery, Mahabihara. Anyway, so what is the site? What does the site look like? Will you like to uh, see the slide at this stage and uh, Allow me to continue after that. Hello, Chetna. Yes, sir. Uh, you want me to uh, start sharing the slides? Yes, and then I shall I shall speak because I have asked sure. more. Sure. Just tell me if all of you can see the presentation. It's still opening. Can you? I can see it. Yeah. Only... Somebody else it. also just confirm that it is. Yes. yes sir. We can see it. Thank you. OK. Yes, sir. Sir, you can go ahead. Yes. Uh, as I have said, that the site is located in Malda district, which is part of Borindra. And I have also tried to share with you the uh, very important fact that the, this area was dotted with Buddhist monuments. Now, <clears throat> the name has its origin in the major water body in this uh, in in the village. That's a very important point. Now, the then we come to the monument, to the mound, not the mound, sorry, to the, to the, although there's an uh, image of the actual excavation, how the site looked after the excavation. Can you see the images? Yes, sir. I, I, mean, I can obviously see. So, the, it was a rector, it was, as I have said, it's a modest, uh, establishment the monastery would may should measure or did measure 32 meter by 32 meter which is a square uh, uh green square green and now the square form as as you as the visitor entered the reaches the monastery there are a flight of steps that takes you down to the courtyard. You can see the courtyard. And on, oh, these are all these. This is the site. Is, yes, please go, go. Can you see this site? Can you see the site? This is the seal. Sorry, that. Please, please come back. 
please come with the, the, the seal, the monastic seal. No, no, no. Yes, this is the monastic seal. Sri Nanda Dirghi Bihariya Arja Vikushangasya. Now, here I should also, before I go to the establishment, I should also tell you that the inscription mentions that Vajradev got this monastery created for a Buddhist sect called Avaivartika Sangha. It's yet to be identified properly. Please carry on with the images. Please carry on with the images. Uh, this is, of course, the Marichi that was found there. I shall speak on them at some length on these uh, beautiful uh, images, which I call vibrant forms, because they are very different from the stone and the metal image that you have just seen, which are stiff and heretic, whereas these figures are extremely active, agile, vibrant with life, as if they will they will come out of the uh, of their background, come out of this. So these are I call I prefer to call them the vibrant forms. Uh, this is the image of the uh, Munjusri. Mar, sorry, this is the image of Marichi. If you look at the image of Marichi in bronze, you can understand how different it is from the uh, clay images. Now I shall comment for a while on the on this. Now the, so. As you, uh, you you take the flight of step and come down to the courtyard, in the courtyard there is a uh, small well apparently for the use of the of the monks, but this is as I said the mod modest monastery. There are only twenty nine cells on all the three sides, and at the back you have the central sanctum, and if uh, other monastic establishments are indication, any indication, the enshrined image must have been a Buddha in Bhumisparsha Mudra under the Bodhi tree. We have found a, a image of Buddha in Bhumisparsha Mudra under Bodhi tree, but I don't, I'm not sure if that was the image installed or enshrined in the central chamber. But as I said, the, the, in most likely, because wherever we have seen the central image is one of Buddha under the Bodhi tree on in Bhumisparsha Mudra. That was the great moment, and all the Buddhist establishment, particularly in this period, celebrated this great moment in the in through the image as the central image, central image. So and then this, this is an 29 cell. This is, as I said, this is a very modest establishment. There are large number of more than 300 terracotta plaques. You can see them, this terracotta plaques found in course of excavation. But unfortunately, I repeat, unfortunately, none of the mon plaques were in situ. They were all dispersed all over the place. And this is a single culture site, so there is no there cannot be any argument that they are earlier or they are later. The site, the as I said, the inscription belongs to the mid-9th century. The material, if you look at them stylistically, the vibrant forms and the metal image and the stone image, they build, the terracotta plaques all belong to the most mature phase of terracotta art in uh, Bengal, 9th century when Paharpur came into being, when Vikram Shilaka came into being, uh, part of Nalunda also came into being. So this is a this is 9th century. And uh, the, the amazing thing about these terracotta plaques are there, none of them are in situ, but they, we can broadly classify them into three or four categories. One is, of course, the divine images. You will see them in course of, uh, please go ahead. In course, of, you, there is an Ekomuko Lingo Shiva. There is a manuscript surmounted on the lotus, which is the Prajnaparamita manuscript. There is a uh, image of uh, uh, Dikopalas. And more interesting, you'll see them, the image of Rashis. 
for example, scorpion, this is a Rashi. So the image of Ekamukalinga Shiva, the image of Rashi, the image of snake go goddess, I won't call him, call her Manusha, snake goddess, all kind of images, we call them divine or semi-divine. Second category is formed by very large number, probably the largest in count, very large number of terracotta plaque depicting warriors in different mood, in extremely active, extremely agile, extremely enthusiastic mood, holding uh, shield, holding bow and arrow, holding sword, holding spear, all. Why were they made? Why were they installed? The, the most likely uh, place for their installation was, must have been the jagati or the uh, jagati or the pediment of the uh, sign. Now, why the question is, why all these warrior or soldier figures were installed in a Buddhist monastery. Now, there are different explanations. I have taken cue from my friend, great scholar, Claudine Bautse Picaro. I have tried to argue that these images were, or uh, they were images of they were members of the Maro's army. Please remember, if we argue that the central shrine with its uh, Buddha in Bhumisparsha Mudra is the main, is the center of uh, worship, then you need to make the Maro's army present on the pediment to convincingly characterize the 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 the, uh, the importance of the central image. So these warrior-like figure or soldier-like figure or extremely active, agile, uh, uh, different arm-bearing figure. I have I have tried to explain as members of the Maro's army. And in this regard, I am also uh, my my argument is based on what. Claudine Bautz Picoro had observed in at Pagan. Pagan, the central image is Buddha in Bhumisparsha Mudra, but all around the uh, Vedika, the pediment, the, you have the detailed depiction, not in clay, the, the detailed painting of Maro's army in different fierce poses. So I think that these uh, images represent the Maro's army. And, but for maybe because of the local aesthetic sensibility, they don't look as fierce as in case of uh, Pagan images. They, they look rather friendly, rather uh, somebody who is enjoying his uh, job, who is enjoying his uh, ex extremely ac active hand and leg gestures. So th this warrior figures, I would explain as uh, Maros, members of the Maros army. Then we have this, as I said, group of images, Shiva, Ekamukalika Shingo, you must have seen this. He can be clearly identified. Snake goddess can be clearly identified. Prajna Paramita manuscript surmounted on the uh, lotus can be clearly identified. The Rashis can be clear, clearly identified. Now, what purpose did they serve? I was not very clear about them. Recently, Nick Massey, an American scholar, has argued that this did, he also argue, extend this argument in case of what I call the members of Maro, Maro's army. He argues, argues that this is these are apotropic images or protective, they have a protective function. They protect the monument, protect the shrine, they protect the uh, as, uh, Buddhist Bihara, they protect the establishment from all possible and probable forms of danger. So they are the apotropic or protective uh, uh, images. In this, 
he has based his argument on a very important scholar, a greatly respected scholar, Professor Peter Skilling. Peter Skilling has, I have not seen Peter Skilling's that very important paper. Peter Skilling has argued that there are Raksha, their deities, Raksha deities, the deities of protection, and these are all protective deities. This is, a, and then in the third group, there are very fine images of different animals, bird, swan, dog, uh, lion, uh, elephant, deer. I don't remember. Please look at the, uh, the slides. Turn to the slides. So amazing range of figures, amazing range of figures. First, the, uh, if I may say, if we turn the order, divine or semi-divine images. Then we have the uh, warlike figures who, are, who whom I call the members of the Maharaj army. And third, they have the animal figures. And <clears throat> Nick, this is a tradition which is not, uh, which is shared by almost all the major monasteries of uh, Eastern India, whether it is Paharpur, whether it is uh, Antichok or Vikram Shila. Everywhere, this the, you have large number of animal figures, large number of animal figures. When Ken Dixit excavated Paharpur, he, he suggested that in the 30s, he suggested that there is no logic or no order in the arrangement of the plaque. But now with new insights, we can probably look at the issue once again, the, not that there is no order in the arrangement of the plaques, there is certainly some order, but the source for this arrangement is still not very clear to me. Taking cue from Peter Skilling or uh, Claudine Bouts Epicoro, we have tried to or array organ try to analyze their location in terms of their function, but this is still tentative uh, uh, and. But I think this is one very important way of looking at the figures instead of suggesting that they were placed at random. Apart from this, uh, uh, the, we also have very, uh, as I said, very important image of Marichi, uh, bronze Marichi. Apart from this, there is only a small uh, votive. Buddha figure, these are only two bronzes or two metal images uh, found from this side. This is amazing because in recent times, Mughal Mari excavation has yielded more than 79 metal images of Buddhist deities. Why this is so is difficult to explain. Can it be so that at some point of time, this is there, at some point of time, the monastery was deserted and the monks left the place with the uh, metal portable motor, metal images and the sacred manuscripts at their disposal. I cannot think of other explanations as to why such a productive site should yield only two uh, small uh, metal images. Now, uh, this is, I think, all about the site. But as I said, this uh, let me see how much time have I taken? Now, let me uh, conclude uh, at this stage by stating three things. One, this is an important addition to the geography of our archaeology location of archaeology of Buddhism in terms of its geography. This is one important uh, indication because in this uh, part of Bengal, which is in West Bengal, uh, in northern part of West Bengal, we have not yet, there are enough indication, but we have not yet come across any uh, Biharo uh, with such rich yield. Secondly, this is significant because this shows 
the nature of patronage in key in the in the matter of uh, construction and supporting the mon monastery here the patronage does not come there are different tiers of patronage that we have seen in case of uh, donative records there are many donative records indicating different levels different social strata different tiers of patronage here we see that the patron the patron is clearly indicated the patron is not the king patron is clearly indicated at shenapati bajro devo who donates the uh, who caused this monastery to be created and support it for the munificence of his parents and uh, relatives so the another tier senapati the general as the patron third it shows that we need to look at the buddhist monasteries not in isolation we should not think that buddhist monasteries grew in isolation like the great rock cut biharas in the western india they clearly buddhist monasteries depend on a viable support system which may be a uh, tax collection revenue collection center and of course number of smaller villages around the monastery so this is the and third and i think very important point is we should relook reconsider the classific the classification of this uh, amazing number of uh, buddhist uh, amazing number of terracotta figures you may ask why terracotta i should in, uh, respond to this question which will not be asked of course because terracotta from at least the uh, se second century bc uh, first century bc terracotta was the most favored medium uh, of, among the bengali artists and it is it is cheap and it is it 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 responds to the to your finger very easily you can give it the desired shape without much uh, hassle you don't need a large big uh, a resourceful patron to uh, make these images so terracotta was obviously chosen material and you we see them not only here but in all the uh, important uh, monasteries of this period and of course the we should uh, as i was saying we should reconsider the characterization or classification of these amazing images amazing forms whether they are apotropic or pro protective they, they had apotropic or protective function whether they represents some of them at least represents maro image as a convincing statement of the uh, character of the shrine or uh, there was some other forms of explanation for these images that we need to uh, examine think over consider very carefully at this stage we will have to uh, keep this question open as open ended thank you very much thank you so much sir i mean how lucidly have you explained that it is not the size of the site but the content which matters and and but for you we would have never uh, come to know about this kind of a, a site and the findings there thank you so much uh, generally uh, for memorial lectures there are no question answers but if you may uh, permit the, i think somebody no, I, 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 ask I, I, something i have no problem yeah uh, um, malini adiga you wanted to say something or ask something please go ahead yes malini please unmute yourself and ask your question yes thank you um exactly what is the range of period that the site belong to what I the mean, range of, what is, let, let me what uh, the period 
uh, in which the site was occupied. What was the period in which the site was no, occupied? Yes. I think I, I indicated it that the monastery was caused to be created by Bhadra Devo in 9th century AD, 30th oh. or 40th of the 9th century AD, and going and the terracotta plaques all belong, as I say, to the most mature, most lively phase of terracotta art in Bengal, 9th century. But the stone sculpture and the bronze would indicate that <clears throat> the site must have remained. Also, the ceramic, but ceramic doesn't have a uh, clear date, uh, or must must have remained active till around the 11th century AD. But as I said, this is this is my guess. Two centuries. Uh, two two centuries. Nine, three centuries, ninth, tenth, and eleventh. Okay, right. Because I missed the initial portion, oh. so I want to know exactly what's the whole range of the this area. Thank you, so, Malini, for joining. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, Anita Satsangi, ma'am, wanted to see the pictures of the temple, but I don't think we have pictures of the temple. No, so no the, the superstructure structure did not survive. You only have the base. The temple did not survive. No part of the superstructure had survived, like in most of the cases. Right. So, sorry, we don't have. Uh, Jogesh, sir, you can please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful talk. Uh, I want to see the slides which is not shown in ongoing lecture. Which slides, sir? Uh, I think a few of the slides were not shown. I think, I think uh, Chetnaji, please show all the slides. It's only for okay. slides. Take two, three minutes. Three, four I, minutes. I, I do that. Then yeah. you can relate what sir was talking. Sure. Just tell me when you are able to see it. Are you able to see this? No, I can't see it's them. Not anyway. it's not it's not can everyone see them? I hope everybody is able to see it. I'm in. I think Chetana, you'll have to share them again because uh, you had stopped sharing and now you'll have to share again. Then only we'll be able to see. You can't see. No, we can't. Okay, wait. That's what I'm. I kept asking if you can see them. Okay, can you see this now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Because what happens no, Google is once I start with the screen, I can't see any one of you and I can't know. <laughs> so yes. this is the copper plate chart. Right. This is the copper Jagjivan. Please come to this is Jagjivanpur copper plate chart. You can see the royal seal uh, at, at the top. This is the copper copper plate chart. Yes. This is the significant portion from that plate where it's clearly written. I cannot read it because I, my eyesight is awful. Sri Devapala Palanu Dhyata Mahan Sri Mahendra Pala Deva. Yes. It clearly establishes the, uh, the the royal genealogy. The fact that uh, I shall I shall digress probably. Dharmapal was succeeded by Devapal, and Devapal it was all these years believed to be to have been succeeded by Shurapala. Now it's very clear. There is an in, but there is an important character in between. That's my Indra Pala. This is the general view of the site before excavating. You can see the excavated site. So this was the river you were mentioning, sir. Where is the river? Uh, no, not the river. Sorry, the well. Well, well, well yes. Yeah. Well. <laughs> the well, the yeah. For the use of the bhikshus and I guess also for the uh, shravakas. Mm. Right. Mm. This is the plan, uh, clear square, 32 meter by 32 meter, with east to east to west orientation. Right. This is the monastic seal. I've been talking so much about. Right. This is the, the image of Maridi, as I Malini must see it because this is 
uh, rather late in date, about 11th century AD. Mm. This is an indication the site must have ex existed till 11th century. These are, you have the Ekumukulinga of Shiva. Yeah. This, and this is Stupa, no? Stupa. This is a sacred yeah. sector symbol. You also have, I don't think I have the photo image here. Uh, beautifully, yes. Punjab Aramita manuscript surmounted on the lotus. Okay. Sir, I have one small screen. Yes, please. Yes, please. What can Should I stop sharing? Yes. yes, please. No, no, you can continue. Just okay. All query is there. Uh, what can be the context of this Ekamukalinga in Buddhist monastery? Uh, I have, I have, uh, as I said, I don't have a foolproof explanation, but taking uh, they, taking cue from Nick Messe, American scholar, uh, who who has it also written on the Jagjivanpur. I have not seen the paper in full, but he has argued that these are apotropic uh, images, which means that the images uh, pro protecting the shrine from all possible and probable dangers. But as I said, this is not a foolproof argument. Okay. These are beautiful. Look at the, and if you look at it, in, if you blow it up, you sometimes will feel that you are looking at the uh, Gupta period uh, flying figure. They are so, uh, so delicate, so, yet so mobile. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It has very pretty shoes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like the Shuriyas of Northern India. Yes. Mm. See? Okay. This is Garud probably. Yes. Peacock. Peacock. You have peacock. Peacock. Yeah. Mm. And lion. This is the devotee. You mm. must have said to the to the extreme right. Yes. I in in one of my papers in published in Marg several years ago when where I discussed this myth, I argued that this image must be representing, not, not representing directly, an idealized image of Bajrodeva, the donor. Mm -hmm. But this is only a matter of speculation. You also have Chakra, so all kind of uh, what is called uh, sacred uh, signs, symbols, etc. This is a scorpion, a Rashi, Karkod mm. Rashi. Mm. Karka. <laughs> beautiful animal very figure. Beautiful and very proportionate. So and so delicate. Very think, delicate. They're made out of wax. So delicate. Yes. So what would be the size of these uh, terracotta tiles? I, Generally? I don't remember. They are medium sized. Medium sized. Okay. okay. Mm. Animus. Huge. Can I stop sharing? Have all of you seen or do you want to see any slide any again? No, no. It's over. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Oh, Very different, you. yeah, from what we generally see in this terracotta figures and everything. Thank you so much, sir. Anyone, uh, Sarveshwar Rabidas, you wanted to ask something? Please. Yes, sir. I can... uh, yeah. Sir, uh, we can see uh, Rasi. Why used Rasi? What is the important Rasi? 
time, I think I, uh, the only explanation that I will report that they, they are the protective figures. They are the protective figures. That's the only thing that I can explain. They work as a charm. Now this is the better to what I, I should have now. They they are the they are they are some kind of magical charm on the walls of the uh, shrine. Hmm. Okay. Pallavi Bakchi, do you want to ask or say something? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, good, afternoon. good evening. Um, good evening. Sorry. Uh, good evening. Uh, so um, while you were explaining about like the possible reasons about why you would have warrior figures on the terracotta flats, you also mentioned mm. uh, about how in one of your articles you assume that the disciple could be Vikram Deva himself. Yes, that is only a <laughs> speculation. This, this, uh, yes, this, this, I mean, what was your mm. uh, the, because this figure looks very different from run of the mill uh, images. It has a stubble beard. It has a deeply uh, devotional look, trying gazing at an unknown direction. So I think that the, this is, here is the donor, the patron, who makes this donation in favor of the Abhivartika Sangha. There is nothing uh, more yes. than that. Uh, so, would it be possible to infer, uh, given that you mentioned how in Pagan the warriors are quite fierce, but in uh, Jagjivanpur we are finding that they are quite uh, friendly? That it's possible yeah, if the they, donor. They happy, happy figures. Yeah, so if the donor himself is a Senapati, is it likely mm -hmm. he's also including this as a part to show the support of the warrior class of the Sudha Vihara? Yes, yes, you can argue that, but uh, th at the moment I, I like to ex explain their presence in terms of the uh, centrality of Bhumisparsha uh, Buddha and the, uh, the real importance of asserting or articulating the, uh, the, the, the character of the monument, character of the sign. Okay, okay. I just was wondering if that was a possibility as well. No, no, these are all possible. We're all in the domain of possibilities. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Mr. Sandeep, you wanted to ask something. You have raised your hand. Please unmute yourself and. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for giving me a chance, sir. First of all, thanks, uh, sir, to, for such a good presentation. Oh, and, uh, my pleasure. And one thing I wanted to ask about terracotta specifically, it may be a bit of peripheral thing, but what I wanted to know is after the, uh, this, uh, what do we call it? After Bengal, Himalaya is also a very big terracotta center and people believe that their migration, large scale migration from Bengal in 15th century caused improvement in terracotta. When we see the progress I, I, of... I, 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 Sambit, I honestly I do not know the Himalayan situation. I don't okay. know. So, which area are, are you referring? Which area are you referring to? Uh, I would say Himachal and Garhwal specifically. Oh, Himachal no, and Uttarakhand, Garhwal. I should I, I should have known that, but I don't I don't know much okay. about them. Okay, so so but the, do you think that migration of artisans on large large scale can cause a change in the style? In uh, matlab, sure, or, surely, surely, but the uh, migration of the artisan on large scale has to be established. Yeah. Yes, in, that's very important and that's an important requirement in art historical studies. Yeah, that is okay. <laughs> but but is, is it possible that uh, style can change? Yes, style does, style does change. That's why there are styles and styles, style and styles, not one style. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking that probably pilgrimage is a better model to explain all these things. Your pilgrimage affects everything. Migration is much more difficult to establish. Pilgrimage, pilgrimage is much more easy. Pil pilgrimage has been always been an important factor in the in the yeah. transmission of ideas. So and trans through transmission of ideas, many things can happen, as it happened in case of South Asia, Southeast Asia. Yeah. 
especially badri gedar i am saying badri gedar and gangotri all three are frequented by much more by bengali people uh, yeah. than other shrines <laughs> that's why i am saying <laughs> that, that that's from the late 19th century i don't know no no i think <laughs> no no it is very very old they are panda panda bahis are always proving that devprayag is uh, what do you call it bengali uh, f- frequenting Devo place Prayag, but not not kedar budri kedar budri was inaccessible particularly very few people would venture to kedar budri they were probably up to yes yeah yeah kedar kedarnath i think first bengali thing is 1591 so that is okay 1591 is not that bad no quite impressive <laughs> Because I have worked on panda epigraphs, na that uh, oh, he. That's why I'm saying <laughs> nothing. Please, else. please publish that. I I want to see my predecessor traveling all the way to the Kedarnath. Kedarnath. But the fun thing is, Hardwar is very later. Hardwar is not before 1585. That is a very fun, funny thing that Hardwar panda bahis are not uh, existing before 1585. There was no panda to ride the bahi. Hardwar is now important thing. Uh, but hardwar is a very late invention of tradition that is a yes, thank you sir i, I don't know much about the uh, i went to hardwar but i was ably assisted by my colleagues from the gurukul kagadi university Kangri. so pandas did not trouble me mm-hmm. uh nayanika jash if you are uh, still online you thank could you, just uh, ask your question yourself uh, nayanika ji yes Uh, yeah, you can, can have... unmute yourself and ask. Yeah. Yeah, my question is, I would like to ask you, sir, that you have mentioned that the upper portion of the monastery isn't found from the site. Is it destroyed or it ruins itself? My first question and second question is, did we find any portion or part of the upper portion from the site? No. In both in second instance, no, and in first case, we don't have any idea. I think it was deserted. and then it collapsed like many of the even the 18th century structures collapsed deserted and collapsed okay sir thank you uh, samrita majumdar uh, you could unmute yourself and ask your question uh, good evening good evening uh, samrita is it possible uh, is it possible to share the bibliographic information of the uh, if uh, if claudin bodzi bikron or uh, Peter Skilling wrote anything about, uh, I mean, the monastery of Pagan, Buddhist monastery of Pagan, or or anything about Jogjibunpur. Uh, is it possible it's to share the bibliography? Yes, the temple, temples of Pagan is the book name of the book by or paintings of Pagan. I'll have to check it. But Peter Skilling's article I have not seen. I have only quoted Nick Messe, whose paper also I have not seen. I have only seen extract of it through Roger Sanyal. Okay, okay. Can um, can can I? Can I contact Rajat Channel uh, to? Uh, you are a free citizen of a free country. You can contact anybody. No problem. Thank you so much, Manjiri Ma'am. You could uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Hello. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening, Manjiri. How are you, sir? Well, very good, sir. I am very nice. How are you now? Childa. Jinda ho abhi tak. That's very important. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful lecture as usual. Oh, sir yeah. my first question is is there any contemporary reference to this site or this monastic complex in any copper plate or stone inscription or text apart and from, where coins discovered during the excavations apart from the jogjipunpur copper plate which uh-huh. speaks of the monastery there is no other contemporary uh, inscription unless you take into consideration the mon- monastic seal okay but but this is bit, very bit, bit, this is not unusual if you look uh-huh. at the very important uh, anthology uh, mm-hmm. um, called the you must have known it because this was edited by didi kosambi subhasi mm-hmm. paratna kosha sangraha yeah it yeah. speaks of many uh, buddhist many establishments yeah. etc but don't name them yeah only only one mon- monastery whose name i forgot where this where this uh, why this compilation was uh, finally made that one site is named Uh, uh, okay. And uh, where coins discovered during the no, excavations? No, no. Palapiri sites are unlikely to discover coin unless they are offered uh, mm. from somewhere else as sacred offering. Okay. And uh, one um, one more question. 
Uh, is there any strategic importance to the location of this particular site? Yes, yeah, I, as, as I was trying to uh, <laughs> share with all of you that monasteries do not grow in uh, yes. isolation. This is this the, the this area is called in the inscription Kuddala Khataka Bishaya. Kuddala okay. Kuddala is a you know, spade. Clearly, okay. in, in this area, the, the uh, okay. what uh, channel must have been excavated by using okay. this spade. So, what uh, uh, and its source is a very important issue here. And mm -hmm. this context, the the Dighi Nandodirgika or the backwater of the river Tongi. There is a major river close by, which is of course now dried up, called okay. Tongila, which is probably okay. Tangon. So uh, I think its uh, location is of importance. And mm -hmm. as you cross the, uh, uh, the present day uh, political border, you reach Rajshai where you have the Paharpur Monastery. So there must have been a very mm -hmm. important network of uh, connectivity mm -hmm. between the site. And many of the, as I said, many of the plaques would immediately uh, recall the mm -hmm. very significant examples from Paharpur. Uh, okay. Great. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Are there any more questions or anything that anyone would like to say? OK, I guess nothing. So before we conclude and I formally uh, propose vote of thanks, there is a small announcement. Uh, come whatever you would like to say. Uh, we at Sambhasha has always believed that we should, I mean, as students of archaeology and as students of culture history, we should be very particular about documenting things. So in that, uh, we have always made a point to document whatever we have been doing. And whenever it is important, we would like to publish those things. So uh, Professor Gopal Joge had given a lecture series on Indian temple architecture some months back. And we have transcribed and compiled it into a monograph which will be released soon. But today on this auspicious occasion, I thought uh, we must share at least the cover page of the monograph, which is coming up. Uh, coming up. And Very we good. would like uh, Professor Sen Gupta, you to uh, formally release the cover and bless us. I will just share it. And, uh, and I'll declare it released. Sorry? You yes, show it and I'll declare it released. Please. Can everybody see this? Is this visible? No. Yes, yes. yes OK. So, what, is, what is the name of the monograph? This is Devale, Conceptual Development of Indian Temple Architecture by Gopal Joge. This okay. is a monograph based on the lectures delivered at Sambhasha Foundation. Very good. So, Very good. Congratulations, Gopal. Thank you, sir. Well, I declare it formally released. Yeah. Thank you so it's much, blessing. sir. This should be out soon. And uh, I think I should stop sharing it and stop sharing. Stop presenting. Right. So thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful way to pay our tribute to Professor H.D. Sankalia, whom yes, all of us really. look, uh, look up to. Mm -hmm. Yes, as our uh, Parat Paraguru. But the, mm -hmm. so thank you so much, Professor Sen Gupta. Without you, this would not have been. I mean, this is really a great uh, honor for us. It's a blessing for us that for a small foundation, small organization like us, we have you as our uh, inaugural speak, uh, speaker for this kind of an annual memorial lecture series You're and i can't really you. thank you enough <laughs> and i really can't thank you enough for uh, your gracious uh, presence and a wonderful lecture uh, our thanks are due to professor ganveer who has always been our uh, friend philosopher guide and support and a mentor for everything that we do at uh, sambhasha it is the same with gopal joge sir he has been actively supporting us and uh, guiding us in whatever we are doing so thank you so much. Uh, my thanks are due to uh, Suchira Roy Choudhury for co coordinating uh, with the materials and other things between us 
and sir because he was traveling extensively and you were always available to us to answer our queries and help us with the documentation thank you so much for that my thanks are due to my entire team uh, at sambhasha nisha shantini ashwin valeri momita sanyukta thank you all of you it's always a team effort and of course last not but not the least it is the overwhelming response of the audience It's any effort fruitful and worthwhile so thanks to all of you for being here and not just for being here nowadays people really are tired of online things but we still feel that online uh, helps because there are then there are no geographical boundaries and people from anywhere can really uh, come in and this is what is visible today we have people from all corners of india and it was nice to see all of you uh, being attentive and interactive so thank you so much and uh, look forward to having all of you again and again at everything that we do at sambhasha uh, please uh, do visit our uh, facebook page and insta page so that you will be uh, you will get alerts about whatever we are doing sir we will soon be putting this lecture on youtube and we would also like to uh, publish a transcript of this so once we are ready with the transcript we will get it sent to you uh, once I you go know, I, you can always bring uh, publish it through your youtube but this essay a more elaborate version is com coming out in my book very soon It will come out by probably by the end of this okay. month or the other. So there is no point reprinting the same thing. Or, you put it great. in. Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if somehow it is getting published, uh -huh. no problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All so right. thanks all. We thank you very much. Declare this uh, today's lecture as concluded. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.